welcome. Welcome at our last uh, webinar before organized directly by the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology before our uh, online event congress, uh, which will start the 2nd of December until the 5th of December. <clears throat> this is uh, la our uh, last webinar for that season and done directly by the society. And the topic that is dedicated to this webinar, estrogen target and women health, touch the great importance of the advanced investigation, the clinical investigation and basic investigation in the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. As you can imagine, looking the names of the speaker that we have, John Stevenson and Mark Brinkert, we will touch in one side the cardiovascular aspect, in the other side to the breast. Our first speaker is uh, Professor John Stevenson. John is reader in metabolic medicine in the National Heart and Lung Institute of the Imperial College in London and is visiting professor at the Belgrade School of Medicine and consultant physician at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London. He has uh, a huge number of publications, more than 450 and 12 textbooks, and he is also a member of the board of the International Society of Gynecological Endocrinology. And uh, it's my pleasure now to ask uh, Professor John Stevenson. John, you have the microphone, you can have your lecture. The discussion will be done after the presentation also of the other speaker, which is uh, Professor Mark Brinka, that I will introduce later on. John, you have the microphone, you can uh, uh, share your screen. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction. You can all see them. So I'm going to talk about microvascular um, dysfunction in estrogen deficiency. And these are my uh, disclosures. So we know that estrogen is important in terms of cardiovascular function. Um, we know that estrogen deficiency uh, can lead to uh, coronary problems. And this slide is simply showing the effect of age of menopause uh, on the risk of coronary heart disease. So you can see that the younger the age of menopause, the bigger the uh, increased risk for coronary heart disease. So menopause and estrogen are important in terms of cardiovascular function. So I'm going to talk about what was originally called Syndrome X. And this was a syndrome described by Kemp in 1973, where he described patients with uh, angina-like chest pain. So it was fairly classical symptoms of angina, but they had angiographically normal coronary arteries. But there was evidence of myocardial ischemia as shown by positive ECG exercise tests. So this was called, he called syndrome X. And that was fine, but unfortunately, about 15 years later, an American diabetologist, Jerry Reven, described a cluster of metabolic abnormalities that were interlinked, which he called Syndrome X, not realizing that there already was a Syndrome X. So this was insulin resistance, raised triglycerides, a low HDL cholesterol, and raised blood pressure. And so this is what he called syndrome X. The problem came then that we actually discovered that patients that had syndrome X, the cardiac syndrome X, appeared to have the metabolic syndrome X. So the nomenclature has changed and we now call cardiac syndrome X microvascular angina. And we now call the metabolic syndrome X simply metabolic syndrome. And as I say, we have shown that patients with microvascular angina uh, actually do have features of the metabolic syndrome. And it would have been very confusing to say that patients with syndrome X also had syndrome X. So the new nomenclature is important. And I'll just stress again that for microvascular angina, they have typical anginal chest pain but this feature of angiographically normal coronary arteries, and that has led to some confusion, particularly actually amongst cardiologists, 
who think that if the, the uh, arteries look normal on angiograms, then they are normal and therefore this particular syndrome can't really exist. But that is, is incorrect because uh, coronary angiography is not telling you anything about function. So the microvasculature in the heart, the tiny arteries within the heart muscle play a very important role in regulating blood supply to the heart. But this is the problem. They cannot be visualized just on angiography. And there seem to be two main mechanisms that are causing angina in the microvasculature. So you can get dysfunction of these micro vessels. They're unable to dilate to allow increased blood flow to the myocardium when they're called to do so. Or in some cases you can get spasm so that the micro vessels constrict thereby reducing blood flow to the myocardium. But certainly the dysfunction is by far the mo more common uh, mechanism and spasm in our experience is fairly uncommon. So just a few points about microvascular angina. It's more common in women than in men. Uh, in our studies, we found that it's about nine times more common in women than in men. It was four times more common in hysterectomized women and it often presents around the time of the menopause or soon after. And this made us wonder whether it could be related to estrogen deficiency. And I will show you some evidence for this. And just bear in mind that microvascular angina very occasionally can actually coexist with proper atheromatous coronary artery disease so that uh, patients may uh, have treatment for their uh, atheroma in their coronary art arteries, but then still come back with angina because of microvascular disease. So I'm going to just show you the study that we did many years ago, uh, looking at 20 postmenopausal women with microvascular angina uh, and 12, 20 healthy postmenopausal controls who were matched for body mass index and age. And they had a mean age of 58 years. And the patients with the microvascular angina, 40% of them had been hysterectomized as opposed to 15% of the healthy controls. And of those with microvascular angina, 25% had a family history of diabetes, whereas only 5% of the healthy controls had this family history. So this is sort of making you predisposed to metabolic abnormalities. And on the right hand side of the slide, we've got our measurements of insulin sensitivity. So the red column here shows the patients with microvascular angina and the green column shows the healthy controls. And you can see there is a significant reduction in insulin sensitivity in the patients with microvascular angina. In other words, they are much more insulin resistant than the controls. And when we looked at the other uh, features, the uh, HDL cholesterol levels were significantly lower in the patients with microvascular angina and the triglyceride levels were significantly higher. So as I said earlier, these patients with microvascular angina also seem to have features of the metabolic syndrome. So how do we diagnose microvascular angina? Well, the first thing to say is that it can actually be quite difficult to make a definitive diagnosis. We diagnose it on symptoms and the symptoms are usually classical angina and also uh, dyspnea on exertion. Uh, these two symptoms are the most common in this condition. We can sometimes de demonstrate ischemia. Uh, in the old days, we'd use ECG exercise testing. Nowadays, we'd be more likely to use other techniques such as stress echocardiogram to show that there's ischemia. And imaging, uh, coronary angiography uh, is important to exclude um, major coronary vessel disease. Uh, and again, these days, probably CT angiography is more commonly used because, of course, it's much less invasive. 
and then cardiac magnetic resonance imaging and the demonstration of subendocardial ischemia on cardiac MRI is actually the diagnostic hallmark of microvascular angina. But having said that, we still see some patients where you're unable to see subendocardial ischemia, but they still have microvascular angina. And that's probably because the MRI isn't always sufficiently sensitive to pick up some of these tiny changes that can occur in this condition. So what is the treatment for microvascular angina? Well, first of all, lifestyle factors are important. Cessation of smoking, of course, is absolutely essential. Weight reduction and increased physical activity both seem to help uh, in this condition. And we can use standard anti-anginal agents. Uh, often they will respond uh, to some extent to the use of nitrates, beta blockers and calcium channel inhibitors. Beta blockers, in my experience, tend not to be that useful, but the long-acting calcium channel inhibit inhibitors are often a very useful medication for this condition. We have some newer treatments, nicarandil, which is a drug that enhances potassium-dependent channels and causes failure of dilatation. Very low dose imipramine has been shown to have some benefit in microvascular angina, not because it, uh, of its antidepressant effects, but because of its uh, effects on nerve endings. Aminophylline is a specific treatment for uh, vascular spasm. And so modified release aminophylline can sometimes be useful, particularly if it is somebody with microvascular angina that has microvascular spasm. And then two other agents, we occasionally use ivabradine, and more recently a drug called renolazine, which seems to be a very effective drug for microvascular angina. And then the last one on the list is estrogen. Uh, and this is the importance of, of estrogen and this is really the importance of telling uh, menopause doctors about microvascular angina, because if oestrogen is one of the treatments, um, then the cardiologists uh, are not really going to be too uh, uh, au fait with how to use oestrogen in this situation. So why should oestrogen be useful? Because of its direct arterial effects. And there's, these are listed here, the, the things that estradiol will do, restore nitric oxide dependent endothelial function, increases uh, nitric oxide synthase production, and it so that's gonna lead to vasodilatation, and estrogen reduces uh, the release of endothelin one, which is the most potent vasoconstrictor. It inhibits calcium channels, so it acts like a calcium antagonist for the vessels, again, vasodilator, enhances potassium dependent channels, similar to nicarandal, again, vasodilatory, and it reduces angiotensin converting enzyme activity, reduces smooth muscle cell proliferation, and it probably improves vascular remodeling processes, but these processes are more important for atheromatous coronary heart disease rather than microvascular angina. Now, we know that uh, hormone replacement therapy can be very effective for coronary heart disease. And I'm just showing this one slide, a Cochrane review. Nearly 32,000 postmenopausal women participating in randomized clinical trials of hormone replacement versus either placebo or no treatment with up to 10 years exposure. And they divided the women according to the time since menopause that they initiated their HRT. So in the green bar is showing the women initiating HRT within 10 years of the onset of the menopause, and the red bar is showing initiation of HRT beyond 10 years post-menopause. And the outcomes they're looking at, cardiovascular death and non-fatal myocardial infarction. And what you can see from the graph on the right is quite clearly that there is a significant reduction and, and substantial reduction in coronary heart disease events in those initiating HRT within 10 years of onset of menopause, 
whereas that is not seen in those initiating beyond 10 years postmenopause. I would just point out that those initiating beyond 10 years postmenopause, although you're not seeing the benefit, equally you're not seeing any harm. And that's an important point to bear in mind. Uh, we did studies at the Brompton, my colleague uh, Giuseppe Rosano and Pete Collins uh, looked at women with uh, established coronary artery disease, but looking at the effects of estradiol on myocardial ischemia. And here they had women who were undergoing ECG exercise testing and they were given placebo or estradiol, randomized to this in a crossover study. And what we found was that those women given estradiol, it took longer to, to reach the criteria of myocardial ischemia when they were exercising. And overall, they were able to exercise for longer. So this was showing a clear beneficial effect of estradiol on myocardial ischemia. Now, if you look at HRT and angina, then this was a study that was conducted in 56 postmenopausal women with angina, and this was coronary artery disease, but it was a double blind randomized placebo controlled study over a six week period. And the women were given either estradiol and drospirinone or a placebo. A myocardial perfusion reserve was measured by PET scanning, positron electron, positive electron uh, transmission scanning. And here you see on the left hand side of the slide, the effect of placebo. So there's no effect on this outcome. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see that the uh, hormone replacement therapy combination produces a significant uh, increase in myocardial perfusion. So this is just demonstrating a clear effect of estrogen uh, with this particular progestogen. There was another double-blind randomized placebo-controlled crossover study that we performed at the Royal Brompton. Again, Giuseppe Rosano and Pete Collins looking at 26 postmenopausal women with microvascular angina, aged between 40 and 65 years. Again, a high rate of hysterectomy in these women, and they were randomized to either 100 micrograms of transdermal estradiol or placebo, and they were simply recording the number of episodes of angina that they got in a 10 year period. And you can see there is a significant reduction in the episodes of angina in those taking the estradiol. So this is showing you get a beneficial symptomatic effect. Uh, another study by Pete Collins, uh, looking at this time at the effect of infusing estradiol into diseased coronary arteries. And here they're using an acetylcholine challenge. So if you've got a diseased coronary artery and you infuse acetylcholine, it causes a, oops, it causes a constriction of the arteries, whereas a normal artery would normally respond to acetylcholine by dilating. So when they infused estradiol into the coronary artery and repeated the acetylcholine challenge, you went from constriction to actual vasodilatation. So this is just showing that you can get uh, you know, a positive effect uh, of estradiol on the arteries themselves. And I'm going to show you just one more study here. Uh, this was a study of 15 postmenopausal women with microvascular angina. They're about 63 years of age. Uh, nearly two thirds of them were hypertensive. They had a little bit on the low side HDL cholesterol uh, and slightly increased triglycerides. So you're getting the same sort of metabolic abnormalities that we expect. And they were given transdermal estradiol, 100 micrograms, just for 24 hours. And what they looked to see was the response to acetylcholine. So in other words, looking at coronary artery diameter and the response to glycerol trinitrate, which shows coronary blood flow reserve. And what they found was that giving the estradiol um, in terms of coronary artery di diameter, the 
uh, the acetylcholine caused a constriction at, at baseline, but after 24 hours of the estradiol, there was no constriction seen uh, to the acetylcholine challenge. And in terms of estimated coronary blood flow, then what they saw was that there was a significant increase in response to the estradiol. So this is clearly demonstrating a, a beneficial effect of estradiol in this condition. So some practical suggestions that I would make that in women with microvascular angina, they may well benefit from uh, having hormone replacement therapy. It may well relieve the cardiovascular sy symptoms, particularly uh, angina and sometimes symptoms like palpitations and whatnot. We would normally start on a standard dose of estrogen if the patient is 50 years old or, or younger, a low dose if they're starting between the ages of 50 and 60, and the ultra low dose beyond the age of 60 if you're initiating treatment at that time. We do see microvascular uh, angina occasionally in premenopausal women, uh, and it is almost always related to the menstrual cycle that you get the angina or palpitations or even dysrhythmias uh, occur in the luteal phase of the cycle and tend almost never to occur in the follicular phase. And what we usually try for these women is to give them a top-up dose of estradiol during the luteal phase. And often, although not always, this can prove effective. So this is just a practical way of approaching the problem. So I would conclude by saying that coronary heart disease, is, as we all know, is a major disease for women. And so if you are looking after postmenopausal women, it is important that you know something about it. Microvascular angina is very underdiagnosed. And even today, we still have cardiologists who say, well, it doesn't really exist. It's not a true condition. I would totally disagree with that and say that microvascular angina is a very true condition. We know that HRT is beneficial for prevention of coronary events, but I would say it's also beneficial in patients with microvascular angina. So it is important to have a knowledge of this condition because you will need to work with local cardiologists to encourage the use of HRT in these patients. And the cardiologists certainly will not be initiating HRT themselves. At least that's a very rare occurrence if, if it happens at all. And of course, we know that the benefits depend on the types of hormones, particularly the type of progestogen that you use, the dose of hormones, which is critical depending on the age of initiation of therapy. So we can work with cardiologists um, and help them uh, to use HRT and to use it appropriately. So with that, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, John, for that fantastic lecture. We will come back later on to discuss uh, the effect on microvascular angina and also in general, the cardi cardiovascular effect of estrogen. And uh, it's my pleasure, we see the smiling face, yes, is smiling face mm -hmm. of Professor Mark Brinkat, as I will remind you, Mark Brinkert, uh, he has served as chairman and director of obstetrics and gynecology with the Department of Health on the Maltese Island until 2018, and is currently professor at the University of Malta Medical School and honorary clinical professor at Queen Mary University in London. So here, here is a is, is, is the big colon room in HRT. Does HRT cause breast cancer? And this is a straightforward question. Most people would say yes. But in fact, this was not so 40 years ago. 40 years ago, the opposite was what was believed, and I think correctly so. And it is that um, it depends uh, what estrogens you're talking about, and it depends uh, what breast cancer you're talking about. Indeed, in many studies, and I, mean, I would like to refer to Harry and Koenig's um, um, review, re review articles, and, and especially, particularly in the special edition of, of the Climacteric, which dealt with this issue. Um, 
uh, and, and as well in, in conjunction with work on estetrol. Indeed, each issue needs to be used in cell lines as, as, a, as, as, a, as the gold standard for causing apoptosis in breast cancer cell lines. And tamoxifen was compared to, say, estrogen to, see, to, 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 uh, to test its efficacy in apoptosis in cell lines. And, and there are also instances when estrogen infusions, even primary infusions, were used in the treatment of, um, of, of, of metastatic breast cancer. So this is very strange, uh, it might sound very strange to many of your listeners, but this is what was happening in the 60s and 70s. So, so then, of course, this was put aside, estrogen was released for, as, as a form of HRT, and, and we did not see the huge increase in breast cancers that one would expect with HRT, and the story for HRT carried on. So I have no financial relationships disclosed, and and um, for a while everybody forgot about estrogen, and everybody discovered tamoxifen. And tamoxifen uh, um, in a different se um, setting. And now tamoxifen, you remember, is a serum that occupies estrogen receptors. It is an estrogen-like, so estrogen-like effects on the uterus, but anti-estrogen-like effects on the breast. Now, in an adjuvant setting, one of the early studies had shown that, that after um, using toxin for five years, compared to controls, these are in patients who already had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, there was a reduction both in, in, um, in mortality as well as on in, in recurrence um, rates. Let me just make sure that's my. Okay, hopefully we're all right. Um, and as you can see, this study showed an 11.8% decrease in mortality and recurrence. Um, and, and this therefore led some to believe that it was possible to use tamoxifen. One is a form of chemotherapy, an effective chemotherapy, a very simple form of chemotherapy because it's an oral preparation, and, and that it was in fact decreasing incidence of breast cancer. Then there was another study called IBIS-1, where tamoxifen was used as a, um, uh, as, uh, as a, uh, as, as, as key in chemo prevention. So here we had patients who are at relative risk of developing breast cancer. And, and this particular study, which went on for seven years, um, and, and um, we will give the references later, uh, it, it was known as the IBIS study, the IBIS-1 IBIS study. It was a multi-center trial. We were one of the centers taking part in this trial. Um, and, and there was, in fact, um, a, a, a reduction in relative risk of women who are at risk of having invasive cancer, but also a relative reduction in women who are at risk of developing DCIS. You can see quite big drops, 43% drop in women who uh, had breast cancer. So these women did not develop breast cancer. There were this much less women developing breast cancer, and DCIS, this much less women developing breast cancer after seven years. Quite a long study and a big study. Now, if you looked at the estrogen receptor positive cancers alone, this drop was even bigger um, and, and, and uh, reached levels of 62%. So um, whereas on the estrogen receptor negative breast cancers, this uh, difference did not show up. So, so, uh, so the, the, the message here is that it was really only in those women who had estrogen receptor positive uh, breast cancers uh, who uh, were able to experience tamoxifen and who, see, who saw the reduced rate. Um, Reloxifene is a similar story. Reloxifene is another term. So this time we have got um, some form of antagonistic uh, activity on, on the uterus itself. Um, it, it, they selectively block or selectively occupy estrogen receptors. Um, and, and you can see that, that more as an accident uh, rather than as an intention, reloxifene used um, as an alternative to estrogens in reducing osteoporosis and reducing fracture risk. Um, was found accidentally to be almost accidentally to be also reduced instance of breast cancer. Um, this study was then expanded to a core trial, which was really looking at the rate of invasive cancers as opposed to fracture risk as an end, 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 end point. And the root trial, which was looking at the effects of raloxifene on cardiovascular disease. You just heard the excellent lecture by John Stevenson just now, uh, but uh, here it was raloxifene, a study using raloxifene um, to see if you could actually reduce the instance of breast cancer. Um, and this had some very, very good results, but um, the endpoints were coronary events and rate of breast cancers. And all these studies actually did show that there was a reduction ranging between 40% to 80% in this study of reduction in, in incidence of breast cancer in these women compared to women on placebo in these two receptor positive breast cancers. So how does tamoxifen compare with raloxifene? Well, they're virtually identical. The only, the only slight difference is that there was a higher instance of uh, thrombobolic events with, with raloxifene. 
but um, there was some advantage in tamoxifen and DCIS, but they were more or less the same in reducing the incidence of breast cancer um, in both cases. So, so these two terms compare very, very, um, very favorably. Um, and I'm just putting this testosterone as an aside. There was an extra study which we're also part of. This dealt with anestrozole. Anestrozole is an aromatase inhibitor. It's not really pertinent to this lecture, but, we, but there were, of course, with RMD the expert with anestrozole, there were, there were huge drops in 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 in, uh, in, in, in instance of breast cancer and women who are at risk compared to women who are placebo. This study was called the IBIS two study when published in the Lancet. There was one small study, as an aside, where subcutaneous testosterone was added to anestrozole, and this had significantly even lower instances of breast cancer. So testosterone also seems to be protective against developing clinical, and I, I really would like to say the word clinical uh, breast cancer, tissue receptor breast cancer. Now, the WHI, as you know, trust Penner in the work somewhat, because the uh, first studies in 2001 showed that CE plus medroxyprogesterone acetate um, did increase in a most significant way the instance of breast cancer. Um, and and um, however, even in these early stages, we had CE versus placebo. And, and, and this slide just illustrates that the CEE, conjugated equine estrogen plus pendroxyprogesterone acetate in women who had a uterus, uh, had studies that went up to 5.6 years before they were stopped, whereas the conjugated equine estrogens not having had similar uh, problems as the MPA was carried on for a while longer, and this was seven uh, and then it went on for seven point two years. Now, I would like to remind you that WHI was primarily intended to see whether women benefited from a reduced instance of cardiovascular disease um, with estrogens and had nothing to do with breast cancer and nothing to do with menopausal symptoms. It was just this theory, this idea, this hypothesis that you could actually reduce instances of a breast uh, of a cardiovascular event, uh, and as a result, women uh, who are blinded. Um, had not to be suffering from hot flushes and sweat, which you know is an early sign and uh, an almost ubiquitous sign of the menopause. This results in the average age of um, a woman recruited study of being uh, uh, of being over over sixty years old. When we know that the window of opportunity or the average room that we we, we treat uh, happen to be women in their early fifties, this makes the completely different ball game. Nevertheless. Even the first study was able to demonstrate a 20% reduction in breast cancer rates in conjugated equine estrogens alone, thus putting the highlight on the uh, effects of uh, possible effects of medical uh, medical estate or the progestogen, one instance on breast cancer. Now, there's one word that I would like to say, and this is the famous uh, philosophical adage, is that association does not imply causation. And I think that this is very important. You have to remember that just because there is an association does not, does not necessarily mean that that association is causing the breast cancer. And indeed, if you actually look at the biology, the biology of the way the issues work, they, there is no logic at all as to why they should actually cause uh, breast cancers. So, uh, and this often crops up in, in studies where an association is automatically um, uh, uh, assumed to imply that there's uh, that, 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 that effect is also the causative effect. And, and, and uh, you know, if you ask any of our philosopher friends, they will tell you straight away, association does not apply, does not imply causation. I think this is very, very important because indeed, after 18 years, the 18 year follow up published in JAMA in 2017, looking at mortality between hormone and placebo, showed that there was absolutely no difference. And, uh, and no difference between CE and, and MPA and CE or, or placebo in long-term mortality. However, what is very interesting is the change in, in breast cancer mortality, where the ones on CE plus MPA, this was and the non, this, should, this is wrong, should be non-significant, had um, a 61 versus 40 mortality. It is true, it was a raised mortality here, uh, but it was not significant. I'm, I apologize for this here, but what was more astounding was the reduction in breast cancer rates, 22 versus 41 in breast cancer mortality in the conjugated equine estrogens alone. This is a reduction of 45%, and this was significant. Um, and, and really is very similar to the uh, rates we saw with tamoxifen and with with the average from all the studies with feloxifene. So when you've got an estrogen receptor breast cancer, feloxifene, Tamoxifen CE seem to be operating in the same way. They seem to be protecting the women against breast cancer, providing their use on their own. Here, this was not significant, um, but still something to be noted. Uh, and I, I've got to remember that once on CE here, we're on 
CE for a longer period of time, 7.2 uh, years, as opposed to the CE plus MPA, where an average of five, just over five years. Um, there was protection in colorectal cancer, protection in Alzheimer's. It's a study that really is looked at in detail, also because the patients were divided in, into, um, into decals, into 10-year groups, and the group between 50 and 60 in particular performed much better in virtually every single parameter seen, including Alzheimer's, um, some of which had actually reached significant differences, like Alzheimer's and like breast cancer, in every aspect of the study, uh, including cardiovascular disease. So, so the, the message, once again, from this JAMA study here, which was one of the biggest of the largest random, random, randomized control studies uh, in HRT shows that if you start HRT at the appropriate time, which is the time when we start HRT, meant to really try and, and modify women's um, early menopause symptoms, like all flashes, fats, and so on and so forth, we get long-term advantages. Um, and, 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 and really, this is no, no, no clinician, no, no gynecologist, no gynecologist or endocrinologist would start a uh, postmenopausal woman on HRT for the first time, unless there were other serious clinical reasons late. We normally start them early. This is when we start them. And this is how the study should be viewed, in my opinion, as a very positive study, uh, providing the window of opportunities seized and, and um, HRT started appropriately so as to address the early symptoms. And then we don't have to worry too much about having the minimal possible dose so as to defray symptoms, but use the appropriate biological, pharmacological dose that is appropriate and, and get on with it because we are reassured that with ordinary HRT, we are getting these sort of results. Uh, just as an aside, the gestages, of course, do matter. If there are studies, the French studies with DFAS on show that this rate in breast cancer is much reduced. So, so it depends once again on which progesterone or progestogen you decide to use. Progesterone, not sure, progesterone like, uh, like micronized progesterone and DFAS also I think it has better results. Now, just a quick word on acetrol, which is another new molecule and a new boy on the block from Pantheri. And, and once again, there's been uh, studies on breast cancer lines um, looking at, um, at, at the effects of acetrol. Um, acetrol is produced almost uh, uniquely in the fetal liver and then disappears shortly after birth, although it's weak biologically, it's produced in huge amounts. And it has probably got anti estrogen effects in the fetus itself. Um, and, and this is what made us think that it would be comparable to tamoxifen um, and, and also fluvespirin, if that, just keep that for now. And, and, and therefore, um, uh, there were uh, cell lines, cell line studies looking at tamoxifen versus E4. And E4 was found to be as good as tamoxifen in causing apoptosis in these, uh, these uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer lines. Um, yeah, right, just moving along now, we can see that here is the result. Here you can see these rat models here, mouse models, and you've got memory tumors in mice at autopsy, right? You can see the vehicle, it says as placebo, and animals who are a little forectomy, tamoxifen, and the dose related response in bringing down the incidence of breast cancer rates, these animal models. So that by the time we arrived at an estetrol level of 2.5 milligrams a day, we had levels similar in reducing um, the, the size of the breast cancer tumor to uh, sizes comparable with tamoxifen. Safety study, here you can see some more studies. Once again, you have a sort of dose-related response here, vehicle, um, and you can see the better results with the higher doses, but there's no difference between 1.5 and 2. This one is oddly low, but anyway, here we go. Here's another study. These are all from Arian Koenig studies. Um, and they are carried out in Finland. And another study here where you can see palpable, this is just palpable memory tumors in these mice. And really you can see that E4 removes existing breast cancer dose, uh, dose dependently, sorry, it removes the existing breast cancer so dose dependent. So the higher the dose, the better, but you then reach a plateau. Like any other biological you know, system, a, a, a pharmacological system, you reach a plateau and uh, beyond which you don't get much of an advantage. So here we're using 10 milligrams and, and this seems to be the plateau that's reached. This is the, 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 the maximum positive benefits you can get. Right, how about new and disappeared tumors? Once again, those related, the better results give you, um, give you uh, in this case, uh, disappeared tumors, 
which are better than tamoxifen with three milligrams and one milligram, we're getting more or less tamoxifen levels. Who for actually means we get good results as well. And you anticipate tumors, these are placebos who get a higher instance of breast cancers, as you can see here. So once again, estetrol, which is another estrogen, it's another estrogen, is giving us very good results in actually modifying the breast cancers and in treating already existing breast cancers and in causing apoptosis in already existing breast cancers. So are there, are there any agents which can be used? I won't go into them, but some of them have got estrogen-like properties, like retinoids, for example, with estrogen-like properties. Statins, you know, sometimes it describes have estrogen-like properties. Vitamin D certainly has got a receptor that's very, very similar to an estrogen receptor. We now consider vitamin D to be a hormone, and it does actually um, reduce the instance of breast cancer in some studies. Tibolone is still being debated, but it's a progesterone-like compound, very similar to the feston in, in, in a way. Um, but we leave that aside for now. But vitamin D certainly is a molecule that's been looked at. And also, problems with vitamin D arose from the fact that we're using doses that were uh, much too low. Most studies were underdosed, but the receptor is certainly very similar to, to the estrogen receptor, similar to a, to a thyroid, to a thyroxine receptor, uh, and, and um, seems to be come from the same family, certainly derived from cholesterol as a base. And it, um, it can only derive 10% from, from, from food, from external sources. The rest of 90% has got to be metabolized from cholesterol. Okay, lifestyle change will reduce your breast cancer rate. So, so, so in conclusion, that was the title of the study. Estrogens was historically and is still used in breast cancer cell line to cause apoptosis. And, and very often agents used to be compared to estrogen to see whether they were useful or not. Nowadays, damoxifen that started life being compared to estrogen is used as the gold standard when one comes to study new molecules and compare them to um, compare to damoxifen as regards apoptosis, the effect of apoptosis on breast cancer cell lines, particularly the estrogen positive ones. Uh, WHO itself showed the reduction in rates of breast cancer which conjugates estrogens, reaching levels of as, as high as 45%. And this was a highly significant, uh, this, was a, this was a significant uh, decline. Um, serums have been shown to, be, to do the same, and we're having promising results with acetyl. So rather than start with the fear of estrogens causing breast cancer, we are now suggesting that if used properly, appropriately, at the right time, we might have the opposite happening. Estrogens used in an appropriate manner can actually be chemo-preventive and protect women, particularly those uh, suffering, those at risk from the higher, the more common, uh, the higher estrogen receptor breast cancers, um, and reduce the instance of those women or modify certainly their pathology and their prognosis. And that is the end of my lecture. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening start now with a question. First of all, I would like to, to thank some of our members to be of the board to be president. We have President Professor Naftolin and then he asked to Dr. Stevenson, could the distribution of plaque in women circumferential with little compensatory dilatation versus men who have eccentric with compensatory vascular dilatation be part of the syndrome X? I know that you have already answered it by written, can you, can you answer that one, John? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Fred. Um, yeah, the thing is that the patients with microvascular angina really have very little or no atheroma. So the distribution is unlikely to play any great part. Uh, and the other point that I would make is that men also get microvascular angina, much less commonly than women, but they still can get it. Uh, and clearly, that's going to be a different mechanism again. Thank you very much. And then now I would like to ask to uh, Mark, why are lessons learned from tamoxifen and raloxifen relevant to the estrogen breast cancer story? Well, as, as I indicated uh, initially, um, the, the, the original studies looking at cell lines were compared to estrogens because estrogens were regarded as causing apoptosis in breast cancer cell lines. So that is the first, uh, the first uh, reason. And the second reason is that tamoxifen and roxifen occupy estrogen receptors, the same estrogen receptors that E2, e e for example, um, occupies. And, and therefore, it is only, well, one might say it is logical that there are some properties that serums um, have which are in common. Uh, and when it comes to, to the reduction in breast cancer incidence or the modification of breast cancer recur recurrence, um, uh, they seem to be the same. But one obviously always has to compare to be aware of the biological, of the pharmacological levels. Yes, you've got to have the appropriate dosage. Thank you very much. And then now we have a question for John. 
Should, uh, uh, what is the most important investigation to be undertaken in these patients? Who might yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, the, the, the best investigation really is a cardiac MRI. Uh, because the demonstration of subendocardial ischemia is the hallmark of microvascular angina. Um, and it's useful uh, if you can demonstrate that, particularly when you get cardiologists that refuse to believe that the condition even exists uh, and they can't argue with, with that sort of finding. The problem is, as I uh, hinted in my talk, that sometimes you don't see any abnormality on cardiac MRI, but it doesn't mean to say that there isn't an abnormality present. It's just that the current te technology that we have may not always be sufficiently sensitive to pick up the, the actual uh, uh, abnormality. It's the vessels, you just can't, can't manage to, to demonstrate this abnormality. One thing we do use is uh, that when, the, during the MRI, they inject adenosine. And we always ask the patients, did that bring on your chest pain? Uh, and if, it, if the injection of adenosine really brings on their, their absolute symptoms, then that makes it highly likely that there is microvascular angina, even if the physical abnormality is undetected by the MRI scan. Thank you very much. And then now one question to Professor Brinkat related to testosterone. Can testosterone be given for low sex drive? This is the, I would like to put in general, this one, and then to add the point that Manju Navani was asking you, in patients with BRCA2 who have had the risk reducing uh, bilateral sarpingophorectomy. Yes. Uh, this is testosterone, yes. Uh, uh, the problem is if you use unopposed testosterone, for example, you, you might have androgenic effects. Testosterone is, is uh, we've been using it for many, many times. You can see from that study, um, uh, um, that, that testosterone was used with an estrozole, and, and there was very little side effects. There was a reduction in breast cancer rates. So, so we're using small, small doses of testosterone, say the HEA. We don't have the data on the HEA in breast cancer. Um, but we, we, at least you, 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 you will have positive effects from a, uh, from a concentration, libido point of view, well-being point of view. Um, certainly, testosterone is just as good as estrogen in suppressing hot flushes, for example. Um, but you've got to be careful that you don't get androgenic effects. So I think the, uh, the, the lower dose you use, the better, probably. We've got the gels, now testosterone gels, and, and you can use a tiny dose of injectable if you like. Uh, but using, I say, a testosterone implant on its own without opposed estrogens might, might lead to androgenic side effects. Okay? We don't have any data on tamoxifen and androgens, to my mind, but that might be worth looking at. Thank you very much. And then now for John. John, should the metabolic abnormalities be treated in this kind of patients? No, open your microphone. John, you have to open your microphone. Leave this open. Yeah, you so can leave open. The, um, it's, it's an interesting question because, of course, the metabolic abnormalities, one would expect to predispose to the development of atheroma. And yet these patients really have very little in the way of atheroma that we can uh, demonstrate. Um, but should the metabolic abnormalities be treated? I think probably, yeah, the, the insulin resistance that should be, should be tackled if possible, because that may well have its own direct effects on arterial function. And so, you know, low glycemic index diet, perhaps the use of metformin to improve insulin sensitivity would certainly be very worthwhile in these patients. Thank you very much. And then we have now one question for both of you is to speak about a little bit androspirenone, either for the cardiovascular aspect as well for the breast aspect. First, Mark, you will speak for the breast about androspirenone. You hear me? Yes, Mark. Yes, I'm hearing you. Well, dr drosperinone is, uh, is an antiandrogen. It's a 5 alpha reductase blocker. So, um, uh, you know, at the end of the day, 
I can I I to be honest, uh, I think it's it's a great gestogen, it's a great progestogen because because um, it's going to be neutral from from a breast cancer point of view. Uh, we don't have enough data on it, but um, it's also an antidiuretic, which is also very useful. Um, <clears throat> And in combination with HRT, it's it's theoretically going to be a very safe progesterone alternative to use. I mean, I, I, I we, we certainly got a lot of experience with drosperinone in the contraceptive pill, and now with the new HRTs, they're not so new now anyway. The patients seem to get on very well with it; they don't complain. Um, as progesterones go, I, I I I think we have the added advantage, of course, apart from the breast story, we have the added advantage that certainly the best progesterone from a complexion point of view, you know, some post-menopause menopause of the women, so they're getting androgenic like features, not only in hair distribution, but also sometimes, I've just seen one not so long ago, actually, they start getting acne, sometimes for the first time in their lives, you know? So using a, a form of HRT with rosperinone in it would probably have cosmetic advantages as well, in addition to the obvious cosmetic advantages that estrogens give. Thank you. And then, uh, yeah. John, what do you believe about the respiratory effect for uh, uh, as progesterone in microvascular angina suffers? Yeah, I mean, the advantage of drospirinone is its antimineralocorticoid effects, so that you actually get uh, a lowering yes. of blood pressure. Um, and this, of course, is incredibly important for the cardiovascular system. And it's a matter of great regret that the um, the HRT containing drospirinone has been withdrawn from the market, certainly in the UK, on purely financial mm. uh, grounds. You know, it's a great shame that this has happened. Okay. And yes. then we now, still have Angelique here. We still have them here. Uh, and then <laughs> now a question, a question <laughs> for Mark. What is the difference in using estrogen on 50 years old versus 65 year old women? Mm -hmm. Yes. What's the, sorry, what HRT? Uh, sorry, I didn't get the question. What is the difference in using estrogen on 50 years old versus 65 year old women? Ah, yeah, this is a, yes, this is a very good question. It, once again, it depends on what you are using it for. Now, uh, the, 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 I think the question refers to using it de novo for the first time, for the first Yes, this is time you know so so if you're using it for the first time in a 50 year old for hot flashes sweats or whatever you are likely going to get um, additional long-term benefits from the osteoporosis alzheimer's cardiovascular disease if you use it for the first time on a 65 year old um you might be wanting to address vaginal dryness or vaginal atrophy or maybe gsm um, um you will you you, you you will get you might not get the nest the the, the um the maximum amount of positive long-term benefits, although there's some evidence that even if you're 65 year olds, you will get an increase in bone mass. You might not get the same benefits from a cardiovascular point of view for, for, for I know, and maybe John can, can add to that. So, so I, I mean, the, the ideal time to use it is, is early, but if you've got sufficient reason to use estrogens in a 65 year old for things like vaginal atrophy, for example, um, I want to use laser as well, for example, but you can use a combination of estrogens and laser, um, if it's targeted, then, the, then the, there is a role for using it, even in these older women. There have been studies that have shown increase in bone mass in a 65-year-old, but it might not be a good idea to recommend it as first-line treatment, only because that's what the um, medicine authority says. I mean, in our experience, using estrogens in an older woman is also good increasing bone mass, but uh, perhaps, uh, you know, you might increase this of thrombosis, say, um, and maybe that is where some of the problems uh, arose in, in, in using uh, with the WHI study. But using it easier on the road, once again, did not seem to increase the incidence of breast cancer dramatically. So, and, uh, and then so these are the issues that are taken into consideration. And also the dosage, we might use a lower dosage, of course. And See what John I, thinks. I, I would like to transfer the question <laughs> to John concerning the safe. Uh, uh, to give estrogen to these patients. I would like also a comment from you according to the age of the individual, according to the way of administration of estrogen. Yeah, I think that in the older woman, you can certainly give uh, start estrogen safely, but the dosage is absolutely critical. 
And that was one of the big problems with the Women's Health Initiative, that they, they gave the same starting dose of conjugated equine estrogens, 0.625 milligrams, whether you were 50 years old or whether you were 79 years old. Uh, and certainly, you know, from an endocrinological point of view, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. We're very used to giving much lower starting doses of any hormones to older patients compared with younger patients. Right, thank you. Yes. Um, and no. again, one would perhaps think that the older the patient is, obviously, you've got other risks. The, the great, for example, venous thromboembolism risk is very age dependent. And therefore, the mm. old, very old patients, you would probably want to use a transdermal route of administration purely to prevent any increased risk of VTE. Um, and it, that may well feed back into in terms of uh, coronary heart disease prevention as well. Hmm. Okay, and then and now, now a question from Simona Ursu to Mark. Uh, breast cancer, surgical solve, femara for three years. What would you recommend for palpitation and sometimes breast difficulties? So, so this is a, a woman who's had a who had a breast cancer a surgery, breast cancer surgery right? three and years she put on, 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 on letrozole, yes, and she's got palpitations. Uh, well, well, I mean, these are the ones who, who suffer quite a lot, uh, especially from vaginal dryness and vaginal atrophy, particularly if they've had, if they've had a, a hysterectomy. So, so um, these are ones, these are patients where we've seen that low-dose vaginal estrogens actually work. Um, they can be given vegifem, for example. You have very, very little by way of serum levels, but that might be just enough. You don't need a lot of estrogen to suppress um, um, hot flushes. Um, but I, 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 certainly, the old-fashioned idea of using a gestogen. Okay. And in these cases, I don't think uh, it's, it's a good idea. Yeah. So I would just use vaginal estrogens in, in their case. And and um, and see how it goes. Think from there, you can of course use SSRIs. Of course, you can use things like like um, um, sixty milligrams of of fluetazine, uh, Prozac, or twenty milligrams of of seroxet, and 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 then these give as much as a sixty to eighty percent reduction in breast cancer. So I think this is where the SSRIs and the SNRIs do have a role as well, which can, which should be considered. Thank you. And then now a uh, question. I, I, I probably go for a balance of an SSRI and some vitamin. Okay, thank you very much. Now for uh, John, a question from uh, Jovan Delev. He, he asks, according to which parameters we should choose duration of hormone replacement therapy on individual women? How long should you give HRT <laughs> for? Is, yeah. uh, you know, it's a, it's a favorite a favorite question, uh, the one to which there there is no good answer. I would simply say use HRT for as long as it takes to achieve the aims of your treatment. <laughs> I mean, personally, I tell my patients that they should uh, they can stay on the HRT, HRT for as long as they want, as long as they want to take it. Um, and in the UK, I would say, well, why don't you wait until you get your telegram from the Queen? Or it would be the king, which everyone gets a telegram from the royal, from the reigning monarch on their 100th birthday, and, and then you can reassess the situation. <laughs> then we have uh, Ivan Fistonich. Ivan Fistonich. My oldest patient is 98 and over, but she shouldn't admit it. Ivan Fistonich is telling, "Hello, whole Mark. What yeah. would you recommend to cope?" <laughs> What you recommend to cope with severe vasomotor syndrome in breast cancer survivor of younger age taking tamoxifen? Um, yes, well, these are ideal patients actually for SSRIs. Um, and and I, I was skeptical to begin with in using SSRIs in younger patients. But really, really, I mean, we're having very good results using using. Uh, using SSRIs on these patients. So anything between 20 milligrams and 60 milligrams will, will really reduce um, the hot flush assistance um, dramatically by as much as 60 to 80 percent. Tamoxifen, on the other hand, has got the added benefits of, of, of being a, a serum and, and, uh, and not having a, a bad effect on your bone mass, if not a positive one. And it also um, does not give you vaginal dryness. Tamoxifen 
Yes. So it doesn't, you see. <laughs> might even give you tickets and a meat room sometimes. Yes. <laughs> that worries us. Uh -huh. You know? So, so. <laughs> So, so, so a combination of that, and also uh, the other, the other advantage you might want to consider, as my friend Fistanish, of course, is that um, if you are using an estrazole, an aromatized inhibitor, then of course that's his favorite laser, which is very, very useful for vaginal dryness. Um, and these are the sort of patients who actually do well with a bit of androgens as well, which is off-label, but they might want to use a, a small dose of, of androgens. So, what with your SSRIs and a small dose of androgens, you will certainly improve. These poor breast cancer survivors, um, you know, a psychological status as well. So I think we'll get added benefit. Yes. That would be the cocktail I would use here, Ivan. <laughs> Sometimes we have a family cocktail that we are using. And then a question again from Fred Naftolin, <laughs> from Fred Naftolin to John. In one, uh, he asked, in one uh, star's estrogen, in more than 10 years postmenopausal woman, uh, if she starts the estrogen after more than 10 years, would, should add aspirin to avoid the uh, venous thromboembolism? There's not really very good evidence to say that aspirin would help in that situation. So, so the more important do. thing is to make sure you get the starting dose correct to prevent the risk of venous thromboembolism in the first place. Um, and if you're any concerned about that, of course, go for the transdermal route because that seems to be um, safer than the uh, oral route. Although to, in part, that may also be due to dose as well as route of administration. Okay, okay. Then now, now dear friends, we are, as we are also the last uh, directly organized by the society uh, webinar before the Congress, mm -hmm. I would like that uh, you give uh, a final comment uh, on one point. John have to give uh, a final comment uh, on cardiovascular effect of hormone replacement therapy. We heard the WHI, we heard their JAMA published paper in 2017, we heard all the European studies. What is your, not only your view and your perception, but your certitude about the effect of hormone replacement therapy in function of the quiet what hormone has been used as estrogen? What hormone has been used as progestogen for uh, cardiovascular effects after uh, now, just before the Congress? Then we will hear at the Congress if we have something new. And then the question for Mark will come later. Then now, John. Okay, so I think overall, I would say that the totality of evidence we have at the present time would suggest that HRT is beneficial for the cardiovascular system, particularly in the primary prevention of coronary heart disease in postmenopausal women. And we really don't have any other treatment that is effective in women for the primary prevention of coronary heart disease. So I think it's terribly important that we consider HRT. Um, the other thing, the other problem is of course, that we have HRT as the best primary prevention treatment that the cardiologist never knew about. <laughs> Thank you, John. And then oh, now sorry, do you, you wanted, uh, in terms of the estrogens and progestogens, then I would say that estradiol is preferable, is the preferable estrogen, and that either micronized oral progesterone or didrogesterone would be my first choice progestogens. Thank you very much. And then now for Mark. Uh, the women fear about breast cancer is the major reason that uh, make uh, reduce the compliance for hormone replacement therapy. I would like uh, on comment from you about what we know now before the Congress about hormone replacement therapy, molecules, molecule used for that one, and uh, in changes in the risk of breast cancer, of natural risk of breast cancer for women. Firstly, I think we have to emphasize that HRT is used not to cause or prevent breast cancer, but to relieve short-term symptoms of menopause. And I think this is the biggest important thing. And also to help in long-term problems. So HRT has got its niche 
and that's what it's used for. Um, and, and, and the women of course, obviously want to improve their quality of life from these symptoms. Now, after over 60, 70 years of studies in HRT, we have modified the molecules. We know that there are molecules of estrogens, such as conjugated acquired estrogens, which uh, ironically is the one that we've got the most, uh, the strongest evidence on. We now have strongest evidence that conjugated acquired estrogens used on their own at 0.625 milligrams daily will not only uh, obliterate all your short-term symptoms and be advantageous for your long-term symptoms, but also reduce your incidence of breast cancer by 45% according to WHI study. So certainly, Premarin is safe. What, I don't, uh, I, we don't know how, why the mixture of molecules works in this way. It's a big mishmash of estrogens. Nobody has ever identified the single, um, uh, this, this, this single biologically power of uh, unique component of it, but it works, it works as a whole. And biology is like that. Biology works as a whole of molecules rather than a single one. Then, of course, estradiol, which is a natural estrogen, which is the biologically nat natural estrogen. Um, uh, they are bioidentical estrogen, <laughs> which we have known for many many years, is with the beta estradiol, is, is, is obviously a natural candidate, whether you deliver it as a gel, as a cream, that's, that seems to be the best biological way to do it, but, uh, but, uh, from a metabolic point of view, but we've also experienced in oral preparations. Now, uh, the window of opportunity is obviously in, in the, for the use in, in the younger ones, and, and, and these will have the, the greatest long-term benefits both in the reduction of breast cancer, but also in improvement in their bone mass and, and reduction of fractures, and also prevention of Alzheimer's and cardiovascular disease. I think these are key outcome features. When it comes to progestogens, the first message is if you do not have a uterus, the, the famous stud uh, adage, which is no uterus, no progesterone, no problem. That's it, that's it. So there's no, no need to have a progesterone if there is no estrogen. Uh, and then we have a number of choices. You've got, if you don't want a period, you've got a marina coil, an excellent device, put it in. You hardly get any serum levels of levonorgestrel inside. And that's, that's a good idea. Otherwise, I agree with John, either micronized progesterone or didrogesterone. And now maybe drosperinone are the perfect uh, progesterones to use. Okay. If you're going to use it in older women, then use gels. They're better gels, better than oral. And, and they treat with older women tend to be targeted for GSM, vaginal atrophy, um, and, and, and so on. So that, that's, the, that's the message. It's very simple. HRT is very simple. I don't think, I don't see why people, you know, uh, it's, they've got fantastic multisystemic effects. It's very simple from a biological point of view. It's certainly much simpler than many pharmacological drugs which are produced in labs like statins and all these sort of, uh, not to mention chemotherapy, chemotherapy agents. And, and uh, you know, and, and people should, should know that at the end of the day, six years of experience plus millions of years of presence of these hormones in our systems um, must be good for us. <laughs> okay, then, dear friends, these were the voices of John and Mark. Now, I thank all of you. I think it was a very pleasant webinar. We have enjoyed the, to not only the, uh, the explanation of the different topics, but also the participation to the discussion. Thanks, John. Thanks, Marx. Thanks to everybody. I invite all of you to join us at our next uh, in con virtual Congress from the 2nd to the 5th of December. The 2nd of December, we will start uh, at 9 o'clock in the morning with all the session of that day. And every day they will be added all the session of this day, then the third, the fourth, and the fifth. And since that moment, all the Congress will remain available until April 15. Then enjoy, it will be a great event. And hopefully when the COVID will be defeated, we will meet again in Firenze in March, 2022. Now I wait all of you for our virtual Congress. Enjoy, enjoy.